So the agenda for today, basically what I'm going to talk about is lesser known or even unknown ways to do recon to find, uh, to find targets. And this isn't just for bug bounty hunters, and I want to make that really clear. If you're part of a blue team or you're part of a red team, or basically in any position where you're committing code, uh, this might be really helpful to discover some assets that you might leave out in the open for anybody to find, and more specifically for me and Ben to find. So recon stands for reconnaissance, if you don't know. Um, what I like to say is that hacking, it's a, it's a skill, and recon is an art. So finding the little things other people don't want you to find. And on the right-hand side, or left-hand side, if I'm pointing up here, we can see all the different things we're going to be covering. So a really quick overview. Why do we do recon? As a bug bounty hunter, why would I care to spend extra time finding about the asset? And the answer is pretty simple. Um, I can find a bigger attack surface to try and poke at. I can also go and I can find more bugs based on that attack surface. And as we know, more bugs equals more money. And more money is just more problems. It's science. <laughs> so the most common way of doing recon in the past has just been brute forcing. And what this means is that you might have an asset, let's just say it's hackerone.com, and then you just brute force that asset. So you're just looking for subdomains, you're looking for any files or folders that are included within the website. It doesn't really do you much good because all the, to all the tools that you're using are just being used by everybody else. And even if you just run Burp Suite on it, everybody has Burp Suite these days. So you're not really going to have a lot of luck. But there's a lot of other tools out there and a lot of other um, scripts that you can run that'll make it really easy to enumerate the subdomains. And a few of them are on the right-hand side here. Um, Sublister is probably one of my favorites, but I'm going to show you a few other ones that you can use just to make the most out of your uh, recon methods here. So really quickly, um, I just want to say that a large percentage of people, when they get involved in this, they think that you have to have like a huge programming background. You have to like code every day. I literally took two semesters of programming in college, and I stopped because I was just so awful. So the last job I was at, they had me building a web app. And they basically just told me, like, OK, John, you can just like go over to the side and maybe commit like a hello world every once in a while, because I just had no idea what I was doing. That doesn't mean that you can't be effective at breaking things, though. So while they were building the app, I was on the sidelines just trying to break everything they committed. And that's kind of when I knew that I wanted to uh, get into bug bounty hunting. So back to brute forcing, different permutations, different environments. Uh, there's a bunch of different tools you can use. Google is your friend. Everything is on Google for the most part. So how many of you in the audience have used Amazon before in your code, or maybe used it for like your side products or anything? OK, so a show of hands. So Amazon is really, really hard to secure. And it's not their fault. Like They give you all the tools you need to make sure that all of your assets are protected. But sometimes people just don't do it. And I was looking for screenshots to use for this presentation. And I realized that all of these leaks have happened pretty much within the last five months. So it's really difficult for people to secure Amazon Web Services. And that really makes me happy. Because when I'm going out and I'm doing recon, I'm looking for the S3 buckets that are, um, that are holding all the assets that these companies have. So you can use it by a simple Google dork. You can just type in s3.amazonaws.com, and then whatever you want is your target. So if I wanted to hack HackerOne and find all their S3 buckets, I would just use this script right here to go and find it inside Google. Uh, the other thing you can do if you're not looking for just S3 buckets in particular, exact same thing. Go to Google, type in site.amazonaws.com, but just take out the S3. This is pretty basic Google dorking. Use Google and GitHub to your advantage and look for patterns. And at the end, we'll get to how to automate your work. So as an example, I have just a simple Google search. Um, Uber is one of the companies on HackerOne that you can hack. So if I wanted to go and I wanted to find all their S3 buckets, I just go right into Google and say, hey, Google, give me all the S3 buckets. And it's right there for me. Um, another thing you can do is go to GitHub, pretty much the exact same thing. There's 14,361 available code results for Trello. And that's just Trello alone. All right, so I'm an extremely lazy person. And I don't want to go and I would type into Google every time I have a new target. So how can I automate and make this really easy for myself? The first thing you can do is you can reuse past findings that you've had. So what I see a lot of developers do is they'll have a staging environment and then a production environment and then maybe like a marketing environment. 
And these three, these three different enumeration patterns that you can use are used across all different organizations. So it might work for Uber, might work for HackerOne, might work for Yahoo, might work for all the other bug bounty programs out there. So I take a list and I put it in a Word doc, or excuse me, a text editor, sublime text, don't throw me off stage. And what I do is I get a whole list of it. And sometimes this list can get really, really big. So we're talking like hundreds of thousands of possible enumerations. And then I use tools to go ahead and just enumerate through every single one of them. And the goal, of course, is to catch them all. So John, how can I automate? You just said you put everything in a text, in a, um, text editor. What do you do with that? You can use different tools um, called bucket finders. And what these do is it takes your big, huge list and it just enumerates off of that list. So if you have 100,000 things that you're enumerating, it'll enumerate off of that enumeration. So originally, we had developers, and we had production, and we had marketing. Well, what about marketing production, and marketing environment, and marketing, et cetera, et cetera? So to go through all the different enumeration possibilities for all of them. Uh, this is a tool that was actually built in part by one of the people at HackerOne. Uh, so big shout out to Tom and Patrick and everybody else who contributed to it. All right, so let's say that you go through all this process, and you found something really juicy. It's like the HackerOne production uh, S3 bucket. And you're feeling really good about yourself because you just found every single thing that HackerOne uses to run all their web services. Well, this is a slide where everything can go wrong. And what I mean by that is that the S3 bucket may not even be owned by the company you're targeting. Because Amazon doesn't require you to actually verify that the title of your bucket has anything to do with the company that you're targeting. So as an example, that HackerOne bucket, it could be owned by some random person. It doesn't matter. So you spent all your time attacking something that isn't even owned by HackerOne. And that really sucks. Um, other situations that can happen, you may be completely out of scope. Sometimes the bug bounty program is out there. They don't like you messing with their Amazon service, uh, services. It can get really expensive when you send requests to them. So you can also have the possibility of being out of scope. The S3 bucket may not contain anything sensitive at all. There's a lot of situations where you just run to like, plain text files and pictures, which do you no good. Um, and then finally, kind of what I talked about earlier, it's not owned by the person you're targeting or just it's third-party apps and developers. Another really cool way that you can do reconnaissance is through GitHub. And GitHub recon is pretty similar to what we talked about in Amazon, where there's different environments that they're going to use before they push to production. And GitHub is a gold mine for snippets of code that never really make it till the end. So you'll have like half-finished snippets and half-finished API calls and endpoints all over the place. And it's amazing to dig through and find ones that they don't want you to find. I found everything from secret keys to internal credentials. Uh, there's basically database backups with database keys in GitHub. Um, there's domain patterns that you can use, not only for their internal domains, but for external domains as well. It's, it's literally a treasure trove of possibilities that you can find. So here's some examples of reconnaissance uh, keywords and search strings you can use. So a really good one is that if you use the company that you're trying to target and then API key, you'd be surprised how often this one works. So <laughs> essentially, the API key that's supposed to be kept private entirely, it's just publicly on GitHub because somebody committed it, or it's in their commit history. Uh, another surprising one that you'd be really amazed that works often is just put the company website and then password. Who would have thought? All the passwords for their internal organization, all the passwords for their emails, uh, there's one time, and it's the only time I've ever done it, but I typed in company.com and then routing. And it was obviously the bank routing number. So that was a weird one. And why would you put that in your code? But you know what? I don't ask questions. I just get bounties. So the GitHub reconnaissance works really well. And the reason that it works really well is because when you find something good, it can be worth a lot of money. And there's been multiple situations where Ben and I have gone through entire GitHub profiles for hours just to find that one snippet of like leaked FTP credentials. And that nets us a really good bounty. Yeah, you can also use Google. As I said before, it's, it's one of the best search engines that, for this type of stuff. I've sometimes used Google instead of the actual GitHub search just because I find it's more accurate. Your mileage may vary. Uh, but there's a lot of possibilities. And as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, this is all the recent uh, vulnerability reports that we've submitted to different companies that just has to do with finding the credentials on GitHub. So one, two, three, four, these are all critical. You can do the math. 
There's also a few other GitHub Recon tools that you can use to make your life a little bit easier. Uh, the one that I like to use a lot is Trufflehog. And I just wanted to point this out. In their example, like when you're setting up Trufflehog, this is on the main, the main page of their website, those darn Amazon access keys come back again. So Amazon's everywhere. Even if you can't even avoid it if you wanted to. Trufflehog uses it as their own example. Uh, so please, if you're using Amazon Web Services, be careful when you're committing code, because stuff like this can happen. Uh, let's see. So what could go wrong when you're doing GitHub reconnaissance? There's a few different things. A lot of times when you find a really old snippet of like credentials on GitHub, it's from an employee that doesn't work there anymore. And it's really disappointing, because you have no way to verify it, because it's usually an internal uh, password. There's old secret keys, third-party apps. Sometimes companies put out like example credentials or like demo credentials to use for a certain amount of time. So those are obviously useless in this regard. And then there's people that are just trying to steal certain parts of like the API and like mash it together. And you can't really tell if it belongs to the corporation or like the third party, and you just have no idea what's going on. Uh, that can be really frustrating because they're usually just riddled with bugs. But it doesn't matter because it doesn't belong to the organization. All right, so a few different search engines that I use when I'm doing reconnaissance as well. Um, if you're familiar with like cert.sh or any of those, these will probably be really familiar to you. A really common one that I see a lot is Shodan. And I had to throw this GIF somewhere in there because all the things that he's hacking, you could probably get pretty close on Shodan. We're finding where these things are. Um, in addition to Shodan, there's archive.org, and I'll explain a little bit about how I use that. And then, of course, CertSpotter, which is, it has a great API. So census examples, it's starting to move to a paid model. So right now, if you go into census.com, you can use it. And I think it gives you like a certain number of requests you can make. But they're slowly going to transition into a paid model. So if you want to use this tool in particular, I'd highly recommend you go ahead and take a look within the next few months uh, before they transfer it over. But essentially, what you're looking for is you're looking for internal certificates for the company. So if I go to census and I type in hackerone.com and then just put in internal, it's going to try to find every single internal certificate related to HackerOne. Uh, and there's a lot. So this is just an example of one that Ben found. And I think the screenshot is on the next few pages. But essentially, he found an internal Jenkins instance that not only allowed him to go ahead and see everything in Jenkins, but it allowed him to do an RCE as well. And it was literally, when he started doing this, he told me, he's like, hey, John, I'm going to go and attack this target. Do you want to take a look at me? And I was like, yeah, man, OK, yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. 10 minutes later, he comes back, dude, I already have an RCE. I don't know how it happened. I'm like, dude, how did you? And census is the answer. So a few other census examples. Um, this is basically the target that he found the RC on, snapchat.com. And you can see on the side here, this is page 1 of 17 of all the results. And that's just for the snapchat.com domain. All right, so work an example. Uh, this is the vulnerability he found, the Jenkins open instance. Uh, he just threw in his uh, Juvi, uh, Groovy script, and then he had an RCE. So that netted him a good chunk of change. So Shodan is another really great one. You can find some weird stuff on Shodan, like really weird stuff. But what I look for is mostly Jenkins instances. Um, the different ports you can use are really helpful as well. It's really helpful on Shodan to specify what port you're trying to target, or else you're just going to get a ton of different results all over the place. And as you can see, there's a ton of different other filters you can use as well. If you're just getting into Shodan, um, they have like promotions every once in a while. I swear I'm not a Shodan rep, but I literally bought it for like $5 for a year. So wait for the promotion if you are, because it was totally worth it. In addition, the person who made Shodan wrote this book, and you can basically learn everything you need to know about it. It's a really powerful tool. All right, so this is um, literally the exact example of what Ben found. So he searched by host name. He just threw in uh, 15627 at the end for the port, and he got his bounty for that one. All right, CertSpotter. So CertSpotter kind of does the same thing, but the really great thing about CertSpotter has a really good API. So if you'd rather just pull everything related to a domain or a URL, uh, use CertSpotter to do it, because it's really fast. Um, you can find corporate certificates, servers, other little things you think the organization will never think you'll find. And just as an example, this is pretty much every single internal Yahoo IP. And all this is publicly available because they use the same corporate certificate for their public certs. And uh, I got my start hacking on Yahoo, not because they had bad security, but because their scope is so big and there's so much potential for you to find. Um, that's basically how I 
taught myself how to do all this is based on them. So uh, thank you, Yahoo, if you're here. All right, and finally I come to JavaScript files. So JavaScript files are really, really great for finding URL endpoints and comments and secret internal APIs. When I made this presentation, I had to black out the name of the person and the company of uh, where I found this one. But I just got an email yesterday, which basically gives me permission to release my blog about this one. So at the end of my talk, I'm going to go ahead and release the blog on my website if you want to find out who these people were. Um, they were really quick to respond. And the reason and the way that I found this insecure uh, internal API was through the JavaScript files. So John, that's really great and all, but like, where can I find these JavaScript files? Well, you can go to the website and just look for the JavaScript files there. Or you can take it to the next level, and you can use archive.org to look for old JavaScript files that they may not even know the endpoints are still active. And this is a really cool one, because you can basically go back in time to any point in time and see whether or not the endpoints are still open and exploit them. And the way that you can do this really, really lazily is use JS Parser. JS Parser takes your entire JavaScript file, and it just finds the important bits. So all the endpoints, all the internal uh, URLs, the IP addresses. You can even go ahead and look for credit cards if you wanted to. Good luck finding a JavaScript file. But it's going to get you all the credentials and endpoints that you need. And this is available on uh, Ben's GitHub. So it's open source. You can use it for whatever you wish. Um, it's a really cool tool, and I highly recommend it. So we use this because we want to find more bugs. We find more bugs, and that gets us more money. And as we all know, there's more money, there's more problems. So thank you so much for having me again.